Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, presented by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation because ideas are easy, implementation is hard. Today I have an unusual guest who I am so impressed with. Um, His name is Akshay Nanavate, and he's got an incredible story to tell. So what I want to do first is tell you the story of how I actually came in contact with Akshay. I'm driving to an appointment in my car and I'm listening to a podcast and that was Finding Mastery with Dr. Michael Gervais. I actually listened to that podcast three times. It was that impressive. I went home. I bought the individual's book. I enrolled in his classes. And here you are today, Akshay. And in many ways, I feel like you're a brother from a different mother just from reading the books and the way you think and act and what you're doing. So anyway, the book and the the podcast created an impact on me, and that impact created certain beliefs and emotions and meanings in my life, and that's why all of a sudden I became attached to your challenge of the Antarctica crossing. So we all have these moments where these impacts create and shape our lives through the construct of beliefs, emotions, meanings, and things like that. My question to you is, what were some of the events in your life? that created your present reality, if you will, that you're creating, you're implementing, you're working on, and brought you to where you are here today. Tell us about some of those. Sure. You know, the first one, kind of the biggest that really planted the seed that shaped the very essence of who I am today was when I joined the Marines. Because before joining, I was born in India, moved from India to Singapore to Austin, Texas at the age of 13, lived in four different cities, three different countries, and was kind of lost in the essence of who I was and, you know, not a very confident Mm -hmm. kid. And so I don't blame anybody else. I take responsibility for my behavior today. But as a young kid, you're impressionable. So I got very heavily into drugs, into alcohol, self-destructive, cutting myself, burning myself, lost two friends to addiction, going down that path until I saw the movie Black Hawk Down. And that movie planted a seed that changed my life forever. I got out of drugs almost overnight and joined the Marines. And that construct that the Marines imprinted into me shaped the very essence of who I am today because it taught me the beauty of suffering. It taught me the beauty of going to war with yourself and to transcend that struggle in order to keep moving forward. And not only did that help me tap into my own power and discover my own courage, my own spirit and strength that I have within, it taught me to do that in service of something bigger. Because in the Marines, you live for the good of the group. It's not about Mm -hmm. your own individual well-being. It's about the men and the mission. And to live in that world is profoundly beautiful when you live for something and you suffer together as one. You struggle together. You bleed together. You fight together. We went to war together, right? And to doing that together as one, it it to me exposed me to the finest of the human condition. You know, mm-hmm. people sacrificing their very lives and putting their well being on the line for another human being. And that birthed everything. That created the construct that shaped me. Now it got, it, it, it evolved, it built, it, it, that foundation built as I became more self aware, learned new things over the years. Because another time, another transformational moment, a big one for me was after Iraq when I struggled with alcoholism, PTSD, depression, was drinking myself to what would have been an inevitable death when actually I woke up one morning after five days of binge drinking and was seconds away from slitting my own wrists. And that moment was another rock bottom that then led me to climbing out of that abyss, getting into ultra running, finding my salvation through suffering and teaching me that even our greatest demons can be our greatest allies. And those were two pivotal pivotal moments that shaped the constructs that now led me to the work that I do with Firvana, as well as what led me to this journey across Antarctica. So you have a business called Firvana that you started. Mm-hmm. Why the choice of those two words? Fear. So it's it's the it's the union of fear and Nirvana. These two seemingly contradictory ideas that I had learned over a lifetime of experience, as well as decades of research in neuroscience, psychology, and spirituality that are not in fact contradictory, but complementary. And why these two words is because fear is the most primal emotion. It is the most primal emotion and and all that's like it's sisters, if you will, or it's siblings like stress, anxiety, and everything we feel at the core of it, 
the, the challenging emotions we go through at the core of them are fear. That is the reptilian brain at, at its base level, right? Activating. Anytime mm -hmm. the brain sees a risk, it responds with fear, whether it's perceived or real. And so fear being that most primal emotion and nirvana being the state we all seek, when you look at that, right, the two opposing forces, these two polarities that can in fact coexist and I believe must. And that's what the ethos of fearvana is about, is that fear is not the antithesis of nirvana, that it's the access point to it. Because if you want something you've never had before, you're going to have to do something you've never done before. And that mm -hmm. means taking a risk. That means you will feel fear. And when you engage that fear, when you use that fear, when you tap into its power, it is what you have to move through to access <coughs> that limitlessness of the human spirit that lives within each of us. Because mm -hmm. you can't have courage without fear. And so to, in order to tap into your courage, you need fear. It's the necessary resource point to attain that new awakening, the new growth, the new state of bliss, the rapture of being alive that we all seek in some form or another. So why do some people get stuck in fear and they can never get out of it and they can never find or get to the point of nirvana or winning? What holds them back? Well, the inherent nature of fear is that it's very hard. It's the, you know, we, we label these emotions like fear, stress, anxiety, guilt, sadness, anger as quote unquote negative emotions. And they're, they're not negative because the truth is there are no bad or good emotions. There's only emotions. Mm -hmm. And it's up to us to decide what we do with them. Any emotion when used positively can be channeled into something beautiful. But the nature of fear when you're in it, it's, it's, it's a hard emotion to be with. It's not negative, but it's more challenging than, let's say, joy, right? It's more challenging. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what traps people is because of the nature of that. You know, there's kind of this counterintuitive paradox that exists in the human condition. On the one hand, where we're driven to do everything to avoid discomfort, to, to be in the place of comfort. At the same time, we seek variety. We seek novelty. We seek excitement, right? And these two contradictory forces... They, they coexist, but that drive for comfort is so strong that we'll do everything to avoid pain, to avoid challenge, to escape it. And we also live in a world that feeds into that mentality, right? I've seen mm -hmm. some of the greatest uh, well-known people in the personal development realm demonize fear as bad. They demonize anxiety as bad. They demonize stress as bad. And so I've seen this happen. People will then feel fear, feel anxiety, and think they should not feel it. They think there's something wrong with feeling it. I mean, parents do this with kids a lot. And again, it's not a bad thing. It's they're, they're taking their constructs to share, but they'll tell kids, don't worry, don't stress out, don't be scared. What are you saying when you, when you do that, right? You're saying, don't feel what you feel. And you're mm -hmm. rejecting the feeling. The more you reject it, the more it's going to keep working its way into you anyway. But the mm -hmm. moment you accept it and be with it, and choose to simply embrace it instead of rejecting it, now you can use it. Because as Carl Jung said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct right. your life and you will call it fate. It will direct right. your life and you will call it fate. So that's the problem is that we demonize it, so we resist it, and then it's still there and it's controlling our lives. But the moment you accept it, you can now use it as a tool to attain nirvana. So we all have our own addictions. You felt fear we all feel fear mm -hmm. and we have a choice we can metaphorically go out and drink a beer mm -hmm. or we can embrace it and deal mm -hmm. with it mm -hmm. tell me what your experience is like in as much detail as you can when you experience fear what is that like and what do you do what do you think what's the emotion where do you feel mm -hmm. it yeah you know I'm, I'm i've gotten to a point now that when fear happens i'm very comfortable with the experience because i've mm -hmm. trained in fear over decades right playing on some mm -hmm. very extreme edges from climbing mm -hmm. mountains to running ultra marathons to skiing across a polar ice cap losing fingers to frostbite in antarctica but now <laughs> when it happens i don't i'm not phased by it i'm not bothered mm -hmm. that it's there as a very concrete example now I'm married and we've been together now nine months, my wife and I. But when I went on that first date with her, I was terrified. I was more scared going on that date than I am doing most of the crazy things that I do. In fact, all of yep. the crazy things I do. Yep. Yep. And the yep. thing is, so I remember driving over to her and I felt butterflies in my stomach. I felt extreme nerves, lots of anxiety, lots of fear. But I was like, all right, I'm just going to be with it. There's not, it yeah. sounds simple and I get it, but it's easier said than done. But just, I'm, I don't, I don't judge the fear. I don't demonize mm -hmm. that it's there. I don't even bother asking why it's there. You know, mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, it's there. I don't care that why it's there, what it's there for, how it's there. Like none of that matters. It's there. What am mm -hmm. I going to do with it? 
Got it. Mm -hmm. I know I'm really nervous. This is a new experience for me. I'm not, I'm not super comfortable in the dating realm or anything like that. So inevitably Mm -hmm. my brain is experiencing fear. I'm feeling it viscerally Mm -hmm. in my body, but I know Mm -hmm. that this is the thing that I want. I want a beautiful partner. I want to, I want a life together with her. Right. So there's a reward on the other side of that fear. And the way you move through it is to recognize that either path you choose, whichever path in life, you're going to suffer, you're going to struggle. So I can choose to run away from that fear and be single and go through that or go through the struggle of dealing with it. And the rewards are infinitely more profound on the other side of that, right? Even writing a book on fear, I was terrified. I was terrified people might judge me, people might hate me, people might think it's stupid. But the moment the fear of dying without ever having shared my message outweighed the fear of actually writing the book, that's when I finished the book. And now I'm blessed to have shared it with the world. So you got to look at there's fear of each path. Choose which fear you want to live, live in. So the process you're using in effect is you embrace the fear, you don't fight it, you feel it wherever it is, you let it kind of like settle inside yourself and then you start thinking, well, if I work through this, what's the benefit on the other side? Mm -hmm. And that's what your trigger becomes that you focus on so then you can go into action. So another quick example here, you own a business, you have a business, Mm -hmm. Firavana. Mm -hmm. Let's say one day you wake up and you say, oh my gosh, cash flow, I don't have it. I'm feeling really nervous because the house is on the line. Mm-hmm. There's my egos on the line, all those things. How would you work through that? So one of my many mantras is fear propels you to prepare. So when you engage fear, the value of that is now you can understand the worst case scenario. So in this particular case in the business, okay, what am I scared of? I'm scared of my business falling apart. I'm scared of not having the money to fund mm-hmm. my house, whatever it may be. Got it. Mm -hmm. Here's what I'm scared of. Why am I scared? What's the worst case scenario? I lose my house. Okay, this is the worst case scenario. How do I prepare for that worst case scenario? Okay, got it. I work backwards now from a potential future. Like in in, 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 um, astronauts, they call this negative visualization. People don't talk about this as much because we only hear about positive visualization. But there's actually value in in visualizing everything that could go wrong. Because in the Mm -hmm. case of astronauts, even in my case, as an Antarctic adventurer, I'm literally looking at every single thing that could go wrong. And then that Mm -hmm. fear of those things going wrong, got it. Now, how do I make sure that doesn't happen? Then I bring it back to the next step. So in the business example, okay, got it. My cash flow is X, Y, Z now. What's the problem there? So I'm always looking for a problem to solve because there's always a problem, no matter what. Mm -hmm. As I always like to say that progress is not the elimination of problems. Progress is the creation of new problems. So at any point in life, there will be a problem. And then I become very systematic about solving one problem at a time in order to up-level my problem and move to the next one until that worst case scenario doesn't happen. And if things, and look, you can have a plan, you're going to move that and things are always going to go by the wayside. I didn't anticipate losing two fingers to frostbite. It happened. So the dream is still the same, but the road to getting to that dream is modified as things happen outside our control. And then I work through that same system to keep moving forward. Ultimately, there's only two ways you can grow. Find the problem, fix the problem, find what's working and do more of it. And systematically, I just keep doing that process. Okay. So let's talk a a little bit about your uh, going to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. What helped you frame and create that as a goal or a challenge in your life and then come to accept it and embrace it? When I got into outdoor sports after joining the Marines, I got into every outdoor sport you can think of as a way to confront my own fears because I was terrified of everything, open water, heights, tight spaces, all of it. So I went scuba diving, cave diving, mountain climbing, rock climbing, all like caving, everything you could imagine in the, in the outdoor realm to confront my own fears and tap into that limitlessness of the human spirit. But when I discovered polar travel, I realized that in terms of voluntary suffering, there is nothing quite like the suffering of polar travel. There is no greater suffering at all in terms of voluntary, as in suffering we seek as opposed to suffering Mm -hmm. forced upon us. And Mm -hmm. so I was drawn not only to the suffering, not actually not at all to the suffering in and of itself, but to the thing that the suffering gives you, which is transcendence. And so what drew me to Antarctica is that Antarctica, this crossing of Antarctica is the last great adventure in Antarctic adventure that hasn't been accomplished yet. So this is pushing the very boundaries of the human potential, pushing the boundaries of the human endurance at at the highest level. And to be 110 days completely alone, I mean, I will geographically be the most isolated life form on the planet for portions (laughs) of that journey, dragging a 400 pound sled, 10 to 12 hours a day, empty white nothingness, no stimuli to engage you. So your mind deals with this sheer monotony, The, the, the depths of solitude and suffering that will take me. I was drawn to that because of where those depths will, what, what those depths will unearth on the other side of them, right? 
where you have mm-hmm. to battle the dragon to find the treasure. And the bigger right. the dragon, the greater the treasure. So I go out there to unearth the treasures of the human soul that can only be found in the depths of solitude and struggle and to hear what you don't get to hear in the decadence distraction of this world, to hear what mm-hmm. I would call the voice of God, but call it whatever you want, consciousness, the universe, the soul. Mm-hmm. You only can really hear in silence. And so that's what called to me to do this is that it's never been done. So it's expanding human consciousness, right? When, when we hear stories of people pushing themselves, it helps us tap into something within ourselves to push ourselves. So I want to inspire others and also find that divinity within to go to a place that I've never been in my own soul. Mm-hmm. So you're going to Antarctica in November, I believe? Yes, sir. November of this year. Okay. November of this year. Um, have you done your or built your list of negative visualization of everything that could go wrong in the preparation of this trip? Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've experienced it. I've made mistakes on previous polar expeditions. This is obviously not my first expedition. Uh, I've done okay. multiple expeditions in two days. I'm flying to Iceland to spend one month completely alone in the wilderness there as a training. So I've done many expeditions. I've looked at every little thing that could go wrong and preparing accordingly in terms of the gear, in terms of the mindset, in terms of the physical realm, every little thing. I mean, even every piece of gear. I spent God knows how many hours trying to find the right shovel. For example, <laughs> every yeah. piece of gear has been rigorously vetted, tested, and making sure it will guide me on this journey. So what are you doing for backup? Are you taking several pairs of sunglasses if you need them or shovels? So good, great question. There are some things which I take re- have redundancy of and some things I don't because you just – you don't really lose things out there. And you, I mean, as, as long as you've done some experience of the thing, you're not going to lose things. So the things mm-hmm. that I take redundancy are more things that could break as opposed to things that I could lose. So for example, the things that I have two of, I'm taking two stoves because if the stove okay. breaks, my expedition's yeah. over. I'm taking yeah. two GPSs, kind of an important piece of equipment. And that's electronic. Again, things can kind of go wrong. A shovel, yeah. I've tested the shovel. So I know it's not going to break. It's just a matter of you know, I can't lose it, which obviously I, I just know I won't that that's why you train in the arenas. So there are some okay. things that I'm taking two off and some things I, I won't be. Okay. So when you are done at the end of a day, do you have a tent that you're actually going to set up to sleep in? Or do you build an igloo? And if I may use that word and no, sleep course. inside that. I actually, I will be dragging a tent. So it's a very small tent. Even the tent has been modified to be as light as possible. I cut the zippers of the tent. So it's a tent that I'll be dragging and moving across the ice every single day and setting it up every evening after skiing and breaking it down every morning again to continue the journey. And you will be there for how many days? 110 days, almost four months. So you have 110 days. You're going to be by yourself. Antarctica, I have read, is one of the most hostile plant or, um, continents on the planet earth yes it is and you're going to be walking across it knowing i can't miss a day or two because my food is only here to last a certain amount of time Mm -hmm. does that create fear in your mind tremendous fear tremendous fear i am Mm -hmm. very terrified of can i pull this off i'm terrified of how much i will suffer I know I will suffer tremendously. I've tasted a smaller version of it on previous expeditions. And I'm just, I'm scared of all of those factors. I'm scared of, uh, can I actually cover the distance I need to cover in mm-hmm. the time that I have? Mm-hmm. So but fear of training. Failure. Yeah. Well, through your training of dealing with fear, you can put your formula, your process in place. What could go wrong at the worst? Exactly. And then start working from that back to the present. And you have been very successful in a lot of things, so I can't imagine. I mean, how will people follow your journey for four months? I'll actually have a live tracker so people can follow along as I'm moving across the ice, people anywhere all over the world. Uh, Parts of the journey, I'll be sending audio updates from Antarctica, just sharing how the day went, sharing some of the lessons, sharing the updates as I'm moving across. I'll be posting on, or my wife will be posting on social media at Fearvana. Uh, on Instagram primarily, but even on Facebook, but it's Instagram primarily is the one we use. uh, And we'll be documenting the whole journey. We're also filming a documentary around the journey. I will be, of course, alone in Antarctica. So it'll be just doing kind of video journals. But we filmed, uh, we've had documentary crews come out to all my training expeditions all over in the Arctic and Iceland, in Alaska, all over the world. And even in Mexico, when I did a 10 day darkness retreat, they filmed me coming out of that. So we're filming a documentary that people will be able to 
learn about the journey and also ultimately be inspired to cross their own Antarctica, whatever it may mean for each person after the journey is over as well. Good, good. Okay. So you're going to take pictures before and after. So when you come out, you'll have a much longer beard. Exactly. And uh, <laughs> maybe you can pose for some type of a Hollywood movie or something <laughs> with a special character there. Um, so um, how often do you rehearse through your mind? If this goes wrong, here's what I do so you can commit it to memory. Is that important for you to do? Or are you going to rely more on a, a paper list? You know, once I've looked at what can go wrong and addressed it, I don't necessarily keep rehearsing that in my mind. It is valuable to do to figure out the things. But once I've addressed it, then I then it's more about preparing to rehearse in the in the right way. So you sort mm -hmm. of use negative visualization to figure out what can go wrong. And then you actually do the thing to make sure it doesn't happen. And then you practice mm -hmm. and train in the thing. So mm -hmm. that's why I was ju I just returned from three months in Alaska training up there where I'm now going one month in Iceland alone, where again, I'll be refining, rehearsing, practicing, setting up my tent and breaking it down. Can I do it two minutes faster? You know, making sure I can do it when I'm being hammered by hurricane force winds because the winds mm -hmm. are unforgiving in Antarctica. So all mm -hmm. those things I will do repeatedly to make sure I'm doing them not only right, but as efficiently, both in terms of time and energy expenditure as well. Mm -hmm. So what about animal life down there? Do you have to worry about grizzly bears? And No, there's no, uh, there's only penguins in one corner of Antarctica, but the okay. rest it, by the coast. Uh, but the landmass has no life whatsoever. It is a barren, <laughs> barren land, a barren, empty land. So the food you take is the food you eat. You can't count on picking up that's off of right. nature and saying, I can eat along the way. No, I'll be dragging. Okay. That's why that's a, that's a big reason why the sled will be 400 pounds at the start is I will be dragging 110 days worth of all my own food for that entire journey because I'm okay. doing it unsupported as well. So how will you fund the Antarctica experience? Beyond the mental and physical challenge of this fun funding is one of the other big challenges of this. The journey yeah. costs $750,000. Now, that mm -hmm. is not a number I just randomly made up. ALE, it's a company called Antarctic Logistics and Expeditions. They're the ones who provide logistics for all adventurers in Antarctica. This is the number given to me by them to fund this journey because <clears throat> not only is it such a long journey, so it extends way past the season for normal adventuring. It is also flying to some of the most remote regions of the world. So paying for a doctor at the base camp, a pilot, flights to some of these remote regions, a radio <clears throat> operator, all of that stuff to logistically to get the gear to these places. It's quite a feat. It's quite a logistical feat. Even, even logistically, this has never been done before to pull off a journey of this length. So uh, right now to fund this $750,000, we've had a crowdfunding campaign going. Our crowdfunding campaign at greatsoulcrossing.com. That's great, G-R-E-A-T, soul, S-O-U-L, crossing.com. It has raised $312,000 so far. Mm -hmm. I'm expecting 175 k in committed donations from two large donors in India that are just completing some red tape right now, but I'm expecting mm -hmm. it in May. That'll put us at almost half a million, which means we now have uh, $250,000 left to go to fund this journey. So at the crowdfunding campaign, we're raising, you know, we're giving away different different rewards at different donation tiers. So people mm -hmm. are getting, people can get access to all the mindset tools I've developed over decades of playing on the edges. And look, you may not want to cross Antarctica, but everybody's got their own challenges. So these tools will apply, whether you're trying to be the best parent, trying to raise a book, trying to lose 20 pounds, these tools will help you acquire that mindset to accomplish your goals. So we give, mm -hmm. give away different tools and higher donation tiers. I'm offering to come speak at people's events also to be an investor in the documentary, things of that nature to uh, mm -hmm. help people contribute and ultimately be a part of this historic feat because it's not just about me. Yes, I will mm -hmm. be alone on the ice, but it has taken an army of people to even get here. And when we pull this off together, it will in many ways change the elevate human consciousness because it, and I say this with mm -hmm. no ego, just the feat alone, <laughs> it will be one of the greatest feats of human endurance accomplished. And these are the kind of feats like the Roger Bannister's four minute mile, right? That elevate human consciousness that show us what's mm -hmm. possible and leave a mark mm -hmm. in people's souls. And because of the reach we will have through it, it'll touch a lot of lives. And so contributing to it will also be contributing to history and the impact we can collectively make. Well, let's talk a little bit about the training that goes into it. Tell us what your physical training regimen might be. If you, in some detail, if you can, how are you sure. physically preparing yourself for this? 
Well, I just returned for three months in Alaska where I was staying in a friend's cabin right on a lake. So every day I would go out or almost every day other than a recovery day here and there, I would go out and either ski just a refined ski technique with no sled or ski with a very heavy sled. I got to the point that I was skiing with a 560 pound sled. That's 160 mm -hmm. pounds heavier than what my sled in Antarctica will start with. So mm -hmm. that's, I mean, so you're just putting in massive endurance volume with a heavy sled because polar mm -hmm. training is a very unique beast in that you have to train strength to have the strength to pull the heavy sled. You have to train mm -hmm. endurance to do this for 10 to 12 hours a day. And you have to mm -hmm. do this all while you're fat because I'll be losing mm -hmm. weight in Antarctica. I'll be, ca I'll mm -hmm. be at a caloric deficit from day one. Now, all mm -hmm. those three things don't go to well, go well together, right? But you have to do all three. So I'm constantly working on getting fat, constantly building my strength, doing gym sessions. When I'm not in the snow in Alaska, I live in Arizona. Uh, in fact, later today, I'll be going out and I have two very heavy truck tires that I drag around a park for hours on end, you know, so physical training and of course, even mental training, you know, practicing stillness of mind, meditation. This is why I did a 10 day darkness retreat where I spent mm -hmm. 10 days in complete darkness and isolation just to practice stillness of mind and master solitude within. So all of those elements, uh, but physical training is primarily tire dragging or if I'm in snow skiing with the sled, hiking and strength training is primarily mm -hmm. what I do for, for the physical element. So I saw pictures of you with, uh, a chain and the tire behind you. Mm -hmm. Give me a description, if you can, of how big this tire actually is. It's not a car tire by it's any means. It's not a car tire, no. It is a very big truck tire. Uh, I don't know exactly how much it weighs. I would venture to guess at least 100 pounds. I haven't weighed it, but it's quite heavy. And when you're dragging on concrete as opposed to snow, there's no mm -hmm. glide. It's just pure friction. So mm -hmm. every step, it's, I mean, it's monotonously, mind-numbingly slow. You're moving mm -hmm. at a painfully slow pace. Uh, and and it's, it's, sometimes it's with one heavy truck tire. Sometimes it's with two tied together. And they're very, very, very big truck tires that I drag around. So what kind of reaction do you get from individuals who see <laughs> you walking around for six hours at a time dragging this tire? Yeah, I've got, I get stopped a lot, as you can imagine. <laughs> These days, people, at least in the local park, are very familiar with me, so they're kind of they're kind of used to me. But it's kind of funny. I get reactions from all kinds of things. Some people are just curious, you know, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And I share, and they're always fascinated. And even that, mm -hmm. you know, talking about the impact we make, that has inspired people. I've had uh, so many people will tell me, like one guy I remember recently was like, oh man, you really left a mark in me. He was struggling. He said, you know, I've, I've put on some weight and it was evident. And he's like, I used to hit the gym harder and you really inspired me. He's like, if you can do this, I can do that, you know? And so you'll see it inspires people to go push their own limits. And some people will really delve into longer conversations about the why, mm -hmm. the spirituality of it. And then once in a while, mm -hmm. I get funny comments too. Like one person said, what are you training for marriage? You know, so, <laughs> so you'll get some funny reactions as well as just curiosity and, uh, but I do get stopped a lot when I'm tired dragging with people wondering what, what is this? <laughs> and how long have you been training for, for this particular uh, expedition? I've been directly training. This has been on my radar for the last three and a half to four years. And this will be a come, but in many ways, it'll be a culmination of decades of adventuring because it's the toughest okay. thing I've ever done by, f it will be the toughest thing I've ever done by far. So You've been doing this for three, four years now, doing the actual training, and it is not the usual training of go to a gym, get dressed up, look good, go to a gym, work out a little, sweat mm -hmm. a little, and then go home. This is much different than that. What kept you motivated? What kept you focused to continuously do this, this one, once in a lifetime experience and, and keep it going? Was it the, the mental challenge? Was it the emotional challenge? Was it just, I need to rehearse more of the fear, the uncertainty, the doubt, the the conflict that's going to come into my mind, those types of things. It was definitely way more mental and physical, the challenge. But what kept me going was, is, is kind of that construct that I learned in the Marines that those moments when you hate it, when the moments when you're really struggling, that's why you're there. Just, I remember on my last session in Alaska, I was with 560 pounds and kind of hurting towards the end. It was a five and a half hour session. And just remembering that when you're, when I'm deep in that pain, the, the, in the, in the, in the pain cave, in the suck of it, that's the value. That's the reason I go, you know, that's the reason you do these things because in those moments you are unearthing the limitlessness of your soul. You cannot yeah. really know your power without pain. You cannot mm -hmm. really know your own strength without struggle, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's recognizing that the struggle and the pain is the thing that gives me value. Even, I don't know what'll happen when I set foot in Antarctica, but even the transformations that have happened, just getting ready for it are profoundly mm -hmm. beautiful. So part of it is falling in love with the process it's, itself 
and then remembering. And then there's multiple different mental places I'll go because more often than not, I don't feel like going out the door more often than not. And that is not an exaggeration. Like, especially in Alaska, when I was training so hard, it was very rare that I was that excited to go out the door. Now, once you get out Mm -hmm. there, I know the deed Mm -hmm. will get done. But the point Mm -hmm. is, there was constantly this feeling of, oh, man, I don't want to do this. But you have learned over decades not to listen to my feelings. If we listen to our feelings, we're going to retreat to the laziest, easiest course of action, right? right? So recognizing there's something more, recognizing the why behind this mission. I know what the value of this mission is for myself, recognizing mm-hmm. how much people are coming together to support it. Every person who's contributed to the crossing, every person who supported me emotionally, every my, my trainers, my nutritionists. I mean, it literally hundreds, if not even already up to now, thousands of people have come together that believe in this so remembering mm-hmm. that there's people who believe in this because they believe in this what this stands for it's on mm-hmm. me to get out of my own way and push harder right mm-hmm. remembering that this is about something greater tapping into that deeper why it helps me keep fighting forward on those days especially when i don't feel like it and just remembering how yeah. much of my soul i mean i've given already just personally invested over half a million dollars on previous expeditions, trainings, things like that. So I've invested a ton of my own money, almost a lot of my own money to, mm-hmm. and also my soul, my mind, my body, my spirit. I've lost two fingers mm-hmm. to this. So it, it's, it's embedded into my soul. And that why keeps driving me forward when I don't feel like it, mm-hmm. feel like doing it. So Akshay, if I may say, you just described my definition. And I think many people's definition of an entrepreneur or an individual that goes out, whether it be a business or whatever the endeavor yeah. is to help someone else to create, solve a problem or do something, what keeps you going? And it is implementing and keeping that dream in front of you yeah. and not letting the fear overtake you yeah. and figuring out a process and rehearsing it. And that's yeah. what I find most people don't do. They may yeah. have the process, they can have the ability, but they don't rehearse how to get from fear to nirvana, yeah. which is what your classes really do talk about. Absolutely. And also remembering, you know, here's the thing. If you, if you don't seek out a worthy struggle in life, you're going to struggle anyway. We're all going to suffer. Right. So then the right. question to ask is, which struggle do you want to endure? For me, right. my worthy struggle is crossing Antarctica. That's, doesn't, it doesn't ha- it's not the only path to enlightenment. It could be, like you said, building a business, writing a book, raising a child. Now, let's say you know this is the thing you want. It's going to be, it requires some, requires some struggle. You know this, building a business is not easy. It requires struggle, mm-hmm. right? So you're going mm-hmm. to struggle. But what if you didn't do that? What if you lived your whole life because you were scared of that struggle? You're going to suffer anyway. You're going to suffer right. through the, the malaise of knowing you're not fulfilling your potential. You're going to su- suffer through the depression that comes with that. So then the question asks is, which struggle do you want to endure? Would I rather mm-hmm. the endure the struggle of suffering out there in my training versus the struggle of knowing I never lived the, the version of Akshay that is truly its highest level? I would, that is a, that is a hell I do not want to ever endure. So I would rather get my ass out the door every day and suffer through that because that is a struggle that is more worthy of who I am and who I want to be. Well, I think every business owner, individual who wants to build a serious career, whether they're a business owner or not, should hear just what you're saying right now, because that is what keeps everybody going. And the struggle is worth it because looking back on that, well, gee, I could have, I wish I would have. Exactly. That's, that's living in hell in my opinion. It is. So, so Antarctica will absolutely change your life. It already is changing your life. Picture yourself in the future. You've accomplished what you set out to do with Antarctica. You have reached the other side and you have reached that point where I'm going to say the instead of the emotion of fear, it's now the fear of just, it's euphoric. It's like bliss, we'll say nirvana. You've reached the other side of Antarctica and now you're in that nirvana mindset. What will you do with that power of influence that you've just built and collected? I will want to help other people cross their own version of their Antarctica. You know, because I get to play so far out onto the absolute extreme edges, I get to open doors that are very, very rarely opened. And it is a responsibility, I believe, to bring the treasures back from those doors and to share those treasures. So mm-hmm. from there, you know, I want to, one, obviously just spend a little more time with my wife. We just got married in the first year of my marriage. I'm gone for six months on expedition. So mm-hmm. I want to spend more time with my wife. And then I want to bring that message out. So we'll write a book. The documentary will go live. We will share the message. I'll speak. I'll do more of these kind of interviews and work directly with people, you know, create the programs to 
to guide people into their own nirvanas. And, uh, and the lessons I've gotten back from the edge have what allowed me to be on podcasts like yours and podcasts like Finding Mastery. So I know that the wisdom I gained from the other side of this, the, I, I simply get to be a messenger of the wisdom of Antarctica, the wisdom of God, the wisdom of the silence, you know, and mm -hmm. I, it's my responsibility to be that messenger. Well, you're certainly a role model. And I think Thank a lot you. of people need to hear your message. So count us in, count Godwise in. We want to help promote you, the Thank whole you Antarctic so expedition, and then even what you do beyond that. Thank um, you so I'm much. very impressed with what you're doing. Um, you are definitely a, a very um, inspiring individual. Thank you and, so much. Uh, we will do time. everything we can to help you. So I'm, how will people get a hold of you? How can they contact you the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Fearvana. The, mm -hmm. the crowdfunding campaign is greatsoulcrossing.com. You can even reach out to me at Akshay, A-K-S-H-A-Y, at Fearvana.com as my email. And uh, that's any way you can be a part of this journey. And, show, and once, you, once you contribute also, we have a Facebook group where I share the updates of the crossing and just really join that Great Soul Crossing team because together, together we can make history. Well, I think it's a fabulous, it will be a fabulous story as you walk across. Um, I would like to be a part of being able to monitor it and hear about it and get more publicity you. for you and attention thank because you. I think it's a message that people need to hear. Thank and so I want to thank you very, mu very much for your time. I know you're going to go out and pull that tire right away now, <laughs> and I will be thinking of you. But again, thank, thank you. you very much, and um, I appreciate everything that you've brought here. Thank you for having me, truly, and appreciate all the support as well. Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. The Implementers podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing!